Lakehurst, headquarters and mother station of the Navy's lighter-than-air craft. From this center, blimps are fitted out for service all over the world on missions of escort, convoy, anti-submarine patrol, mine sweeping, and air-sea rescue. And back to the shops at Lakehurst, blimps return for inspection and reconditioning after months of service in the corroding sea air and humid tropics. So here, personnel are trained to become lighter-than-air pilots, mechanics, riggers, radio men, and repairmen. As the ships in the course of major overhaul pass through the fabric, car, and engine shops, the trainees are instructed in both theory and practice. More than 8,500 officers and enlisted men have graduated from the Lakehurst schools. A course in ballooning starts the training of the future blimp pilot. Basically, a blimp is a streamlined balloon with motors to drive it and rudders to steer it. So an understanding of ballooning is needed in case the blimp motors fail. Free ballooning also gives first-hand knowledge of atmospheric structure, aerostatics, and airship control by use of ballast and valving of lifting gas. The training balloon is filled with enough buoyant gas to lift the flight instructor, his four students, flight instrument equipment, carrier pigeons, and about 800 pounds of sand ballast. They're off gone with the wind, which carries them at its own speed and in its own direction. In flight, the student pilots seek out the most favorable winds by varying the altitude of the balloon through use of ballast or release of lifting gas. Knowing that their total weight must exactly balance the lift of the helium gas to make the balloon fly at a given height, they carefully attain this equilibrium constantly allowing for changes in temperature, cloudiness, air pressure, and humidity. While valving helium to make intermediate landings, and then dropping just enough ballast to leave the ground again, the novice aeronauts begin to acquire that feel of the air so essential to free flight, be it in glider, balloon, or an airship adrift. More than a score of intermediate landings are made before the instructor orders the final landing. Emergency landings in difficult terrain may be in store for the future blimp pilots. So bare and level spots are not necessarily chosen for training landings. After deflating, the crew packs the balloon envelope in its own basket for return to the base. Five instructed flights and a solo flight finish this preliminary phase of pilot training. Here in the classroom, student pilots get down to earth to wrestle with courses in aerodynamics, aerostatics, navigation, aerology, and a dozen other technical subjects on airship piloting, maintenance, and repair. Instruction of groups speaking a foreign language, such as these Latin American Allied officers, requires the assistance of a Navy interpreter. The exacting training of enlisted crewmen is meantime progressing. Each man takes his part in a complete airship overhaul during six months of classroom and manual work. While assembling and reconditioning the actual equipment which will later be their responsibility, the men learn maintenance at its source. Two 550 horsepower Pratt & Whitney engines give the airship about four times the speed of a destroyer escort, with many times the DE's range of visibility. Out on the ships are the student airship riggers, learning how to inspect each structural part, 
both inside and outside the blimp cars. A different ship goes through the repair line every week. Meantime, the student pilots are proving flight theories in dynamic flight. Each pilot begins three months primary instruction in the L-type trainer, first in level flight and then in specified rates of ascents and descents. A number of successful touch-and-go approaches to the landing mat in the L-ship, and he then moves up to the somewhat larger transition training ship, the G-type. Here the pilot sets a G-ship gently on the mat in the correct trim and static weight. Advanced shop training for the enlisted men includes inflating and rigging a complete airship. The reconditioned envelope from the inspection shop is carefully laid out on the inflation deck. Most of its length of 253 feet is covered with an inflation net to restrain the bag while it is being filled. Riggers go shoeless or wear soft-soled shoes to avoid injury to the envelope's three-ply rubberized fabric. Stabilizing fins are attached to the tail before the envelope is inflated. Sandbags attached to the edges of the inflation net counteract the lift of the gas and keep the big bag from surging. Non-inflammable helium is used in all our lighter-than-air craft. A half million cubic feet fills a K-ship envelope such as this one with some left over for its first topping up. struggles to its knees, the lift of the inrushing helium makes the crew hasten to lower the sandbags and keep them within reach. The control car is now rolled into place under the belly of the ship. Weighing 10 tons fully loaded, the 45-foot car carries not only the driving power of the dirigible, but fuel for the engine, electric power for a maze of radio and electronic equipment, and a crew of 10 officers and men. Eighty percent of the car's weight is distributed to internal suspension points along the top of the bag, and 20 percent is suspended from the bottom where it touches the fabric. With the control car securely attached and the envelope under constant pressure, the inflation net and sandbags have served their purpose and may be removed. is bunched together at the center of the ship so that it may be lifted aloft and held ready for lowering over the next airship to be inflated. With 
propellers mounted on the reconditioned engine, the major overhaul is completed and the trainees are ready to start on another blimp, helping to speed it back to its duties at an operating base. During the final phase of the enlisted men's ground training, the student pilot is undergoing his last primary flight checks, soloing in an L ship. If he passes, he will move to the final K ship training with a complete operational flight crew. Here, a crew of 10 men with flight instructors along to supervise man a K-type patrol ship to coordinate their airmanship as a team. Routine duties of pilots and crewmen soon become habits, and emergency measures are rehearsed until they too are performed instantly and instinctively. Now the trained crew goes through active service maneuvers, preparing for combat or utility missions, rescue jobs, or abandoned ship orders. Varieties of weather constantly add to the experience of the team which in actual operations may have to handle efficiently a hundred different types of missions. Engines, fuel tanks, and instruments are under the constant vigil of the flight mechanics. Across the car is a radio man on duty at communications, and the aft lookout transfers some of the cargo from the commissary to his stomach without altering the ship's gross weight. Final test of the pilot's skill and judgment, the way he lands the ship. Whether the landing is to be light and high or low and heavy will depend on the pilot's estimation of the wind velocity, the ship's condition, and a number of other factors, which make it improbable that any two landings will ever be exactly alike. Here the K-ship is landed on the taxi wheel and rolled up to the ground handling party for attaching to the mooring mast 45 feet high. Before being designated naval aviators or combat air crewmen in the airship branch, officers and men are assigned to actual missions. They combine combat training with genuine escort of a wartime convoy. Because of this training, not one blimp escorted ship was lost throughout the war. On the way to the rendezvous, the pilots are on the lookout for floating mines. Mine spotting is a major task of blimps, which assist in cleaning out the war-torn harbors of Europe. Navigation to the convoy is assisted by radar. home, the pilot instructor makes a practice bombing run on a simulated sub. Here on a desolate tropic island, a blimp performs a typical rescue pickup of a downed aviator. If a wheel landing is not feasible, the victims of a crash are lifted to the ship in a rescue ring. The same crew that learned to hold the ship motionless over the training field in the States here hauls a survivor aboard in the wasteland of Brazil. Aviators down in the water anywhere within the cruising radius of a blimp have lived to fly again thanks to this boy 
ear lowered to a survivor. If he has been injured in the crash, a crewman and life raft are lowered to assist him aboard. Thus, the highly trained crews of lighter-than-air men move on from Lakehurst to strategically placed bases in both hemispheres. From these centers, three million square miles of waters are guarded by the lighter-than-air arm with missions of guardianship, combat, and mercy.